All right. Saskia Sassen is the Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology in the Department of Sociology and the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University in New York. Um, she has published a series of uh, extraordinarily influential books. I'll name some of them, a few. I mean, published in over 20 languages so far. The Global City, Territory Authority Rights, from Medieval to Global Assemblages, Cities in a World Economy, and the most recent, which is also now in Finnish, Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy. Um, she is, of course, a scholar who has had uh, much recognition and impact and inspired many other scholars. And, and many critics. And many critics as well. <laughs> William Robinson um, comes to mind. But the, uh, she uh, has achieved many awards, some of the highest awards that a social scientist can receive. Um, I, I would say that my encounters with her, she is uh, always steadfast and dedicated and hardworking. Um, are there many times we've crossed our paths? Um, and today, um, we are going to be privileged to hear her give us a talk. She's come this way to give us this talk on predatory formations, uh, dressed in Wall Street suits and algorithmic maths. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest for the keynote, Professor Saskia Sass. Okay, very good. There you go. So, um, I, I, um, I have for the last really decade uh, been engaged also with the notion that we need to change some of the methodologies that we use. And so, one framing uh, that I like to, to sort of develop very briefly is this notion that I put myself in a zone that I call before method. I'm thinking of existing methodologies that are dominant in the social sciences, not alternative methodologies like you have developed. Huh? So it's a, it's a critique of uh, a modus operandi where the knowledge silos get narrower and narrower. We see this in the diverse social sciences. And then in the end, there are little wrinkles on this author said that and the this. No, we need transversality. And so I have been very keen on, on cutting across these silos, which is sort of an interesting exercise, you know, if you think about it. I, I do recommend it if you're interested. So in other words, I'm not saying declaring death against existing methods. Those existing methods serve a purpose. What I'm saying is that enough has changed in the world that we need also additional method. That is one sort of kindly way <laughs> of putting it. And, um, and out of that then comes this notion, what happens if I look at condition X, not just in terms of the features of the X, but actually in terms of all kinds of other features, the A, the B, the C, the D, you know, whatever the diversities. And so then you begin to discover and you capture something that needs to be narrated, that needs to be made into a proposition, etc. So there's work to be done. So a bit the way I talk about, the way I will talk in this brief talk, uh, comes you know, through that kind of uh, uh, effort. So before method to me is a provocation, you know, we cannot do without method. Of course I depend on method, but putting it like that, in a talk before method. It's like, let's wake up. Uh, it's not a declaration of war. It's not that. Um, and so, so what, two little elements, I mean, I have a longer list clearly. The fuzzy edges of paradigmatic knowledge, that is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in that which is at the edges, not the core. The core is strong in the diverse social sciences. But I'm interested in when we have so much movement here in terms of light on and off. <laughs> it's beautiful, beautiful. No, keep it going. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the fuzzy edges of paradigmatic knowledge, so that the edge is where the stuff is, you know, the, the strength of the center is weakened at the edge. You know, it's one way of thinking about it. And hence, an analytic tactics, or I always have the doubt, what is better, or a tactical analytics. 
I'm beginning to think more and more that the second term is, is better, the tactical analytics. You know what I mean? But anyhow, we can, we can discuss that or not discuss it at all. I mean, either way is fine. Um, let's see now. Let's see. Do I push it? Okay, there we go. So here are some of these analytic tactics. Very quickly. So one is the notion of, like I already said, destabilizing stable meanings. What is the economy today? What is the political condition today? You, know, you, you can make a very, very long list, depending on what you're interested in. And it doesn't mean throwing it out. It means destabilizing it, destabilizing it enough that you can actually see something that you were not seeing. That you can say, you know what, that is dead. It's no longer working. We have categories that are dead. It happens to categories. It happens to humans too, by the way, you know, so. <laughs> uh, now, a third element here, this is my particular uh, uh, interest in the territorial. I think the territorial, which for me is not simply nation state, clearly, uh, territory, uh, is very interesting. So. The, the notion, and I will talk about that a bit, uh, the notion that, that the territorial, I would say it really starts in the 1980s in most of the West, um, when we deregulate, privatize, and globalize. Globalize in quotation marks, a particular kind of globalizing. And by the 1980s, we've really done it. It starts sort of in the 1975, et cetera. You know that really we see a change happening. Um, so, so then these, the, the, the new framings within which we operate change. For instance, one issue that to me is, is a major effort is to track how cities have really gone far more global in many ways. You know, not cities as such, but you know, various actors, various urban actors are now cutting across barriers in a way that national governments can't do and often do not want to do. So when you look at all kinds of business from very uh, uh, poorish migrant trading routes to very, very fancy high finance, which is everywhere now, uh, you, know, you see that they have these particular circuits. It's not the whole thing. It's not an opening of a whole country and of other countries. No, no, no. There are very particular vectors that are in play. So that is sort of one thing. Now, the notion of expulsions, I, I use that in the book. I see beautiful, that makes me so happy. I hadn't seen, there is a beautiful copy there. Also beautiful of me. I'm not that beautiful as a soul. <laughs> you know, it's one of the things that happens. That, <laughs> But um, um, so the question of expulsions for me, I'm trying to capture, to develop a category where the expulsion happens inside a nation state. I'm not talking about the more common condition, which is people being expelled from a country like the United States is doing. Uh, I think expulsions happen to a very large extent inside a sovereign territory. And that changes the, the question. You know, if it's inside your country that the expulsions happen, that's a different meaning. That is not the same as expelling from a country. You, you can see that, right? Um, and so when I, when I wrote this book, I was very interested in capturing sort of emergent modes inside some of the major countries that I was looking at, uh, but especially also the United States and the European countries, of course, uh, that, that really happens inside. And hence, what does that mean? And uh, simple examples, um, in the United States, the United States, of course, is exhibit number one when it comes to contemporary modern brutality. Yeah? And I meant contemporary, modern, you know, that kind of brutality, not the brutality of the Middle Ages or the, no, no, no. I'm talking about very current, often brilliant innovations that are brutal. And there's quite a list, but I'll talk about a few of them. So, so that kind of a thing. So, so I, I wanted to get through the term expulsions at what's happening inside, including inside very advanced systems like high finance, you know, which is an admirable form of knowledge, but uh, also is, is, has problematic features to it. Um, 
Now, when I say here, the making of it all, that's a way of, you know, a way of putting it, a way of speaking. It's not literally capturing this other side of that term, which is that stuff is made, you know? Almost everything <laughs> that we use and are is made. It doesn't just fall from the sky ready-made. That puts a burden on us. And certainly now with the whole question of climate change, that's becoming very, very sort of active and real. But really this notion that we are makers, for good or for bad. You know, we've done some very good things and some very bad things. But we have made, we have made a lot. Again, very good and very problematic. And now we're going to have to make more and of a different kind to deal with that very problematic and to deal with the inequalities. So this notion that stuff is made, uh, poverty is made, uh, success is made. You know, you can just put a very long list. So anyhow, um, uh, so this, I, I, really, I really like this word making. When I, I, I started to, to like it sort of just maybe a decade ago. I realize some of you were not probably born a decade ago, but anyhow, for me, it is a fairly recent. Uh, uh. Now, now, one way of framing it, one way, and here the critical point also is we're now dealing with very complex systems. And complex systems often means that you, you cannot see everything and you cannot capture everything. So one way of framing it, just to get a passage into, like a ticket into a complex zone. I often tell my students, you know, if you don't know how to engage a complicated condition, construct a pathway into it, a little bridge, you know? So that is a bit this, this uh, what I'm doing here by emphasizing or asking the question, what's the steam engine of our epoch? The steam engine changed a lot of conditions, the original steam engine, but it didn't change everything. It changed some things. And in that sense, it reveals the fact that a complex system can construct a radical transformation with minimal interventions. A lot of the way we live, no matter our modernity and all of that, you know, our whatever, four, four, they also were, we had to eat, we had to clean ourselves, we had to do this, we had to take care of the babies, we, you know. So what has changed? What is it that really has changed? is one sort of also way of asking it. Um, and then I like this phrase also, that which can make a new ordering. Not simply power, not simply destruction, but an ordering. And again, if I just look at our current modernity, I think of the, the period, the 1970s, and sort of consolidated in the 1980s, we made a big transformation. We cannot see it, though. Because the way complex systems change is not something that, oh my God, look, it changed. No, we don't. We have so many complexities that, uh, that we can't quite totally track how our systems have changed. But you know, there is more and more interesting work that is, that is actually doing this. And, and then finally, a bit more on the brutal angle, what is in and what is out. So in the United States, we have a lot of brilliant developments, innovations, and at the other end, we have a lot of very simple, straightforward, brutal expelling of all kinds of people, robbing them from a, from a life, from a, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's a very, very broad spectrum. Now, I want to, to invite you to, to look at this. Um, we don't have a, a pointer here, huh? There's a lot of stuff, but I don't think I see a pointer. OK, so, so I want you to, to, and I'm going to have to, can you hear me in the back when I speak this way? Yes, OK, good. So, so I want you to see, this is 201. This is less than a trillion, right? And then um, a particular instrument, just one little instrument. And then seven or eight years later, it's 62 trillion. That's much more. That's 62 times this. Okay, now, 
That value up there, 62 trillion, um, was just about global GDP. This is one financial instrument. This instrument at, at, uh, uh, is only 10% of what was the value of finance in these years. You understand what I'm saying or not? In other words, look at the curve. It's almost straight, right? So in a very short period of time, an incredible transformation happens. And this is just one, one type of instrument within that financial world, because this is about finance now. Um, this represented only 10% of the global value of finance. So the 10% is, was more than global GDP at that point. And for finance, this was just 10%. That gives you a sense of a capability, in this case, very powerful and in many ways very destructive, and an actor that functions simply differently than many of the other economic actors. And so I'm going to eventually talk a bit more about this whole notion of algorithmic mathematics and how the, the, cap the kind of capability that that is. It's a capability that can do amazing stuff that is very good, and it can do amazing stuff that is really very bad. You know, it goes both ways. So, um, second element that I want to put on the table. Bernanke, he was the former head of our central bank. He was, unlike the current chap, he was a very uh, decent guy. He was a professor at Princeton. You know, professors tend to be decent people. <laughs> yeah, really, they are. Mostly they are, right. But... Um, uh, so, so, so he delivers himself when he steps down, he gives the speech, and he said, and then we have, look at the language, the dark pools in finance. Dark, can you imagine the head of the central bank of the United States talking about dark pools of finance? I mean, there was like a little revolution. Most people didn't pick up on that. Particularly what he was saying is, there is a whole other world, and then he actually explicated, there's a whole other world of finance, which is big uh, uh, firms, private firms, that operate networks where, with many rich contributing to it, which are really closed, and the central bank doesn't know doesn't have access to them. These are very private networks. They are not illegal, which, by the way, footnote, footnote, the question of what is legal and what is illegal has really, when you look at these kinds of domains, and this is just one very particular, very extreme domain, uh, it really is what is legal because we don't have enough developed legality to capture uh, what all is happening. And these dark pools in finance are one example of that. And so Bernanke actually uh, explained it you know, to people, etc. So he said, look, we have these private networks. It's, it's mostly financial firms, that, you know, but there are many. Huh? And they create these dark pools in finance where a lot of the transaction happens. The stock market, <laughs> that's for you and me, for us who don't have money. And then they keep taking out, I don't know if people know what is happening, like all the major pension funds. The Dutch, by the way, fought back. So they all have an added 2%. 2% sounds very little to the existing 3%. That was sort of the norm. Uh, but they were taken out. Why? Because the financial system had entered the fund, has entered the funds, and made just a little transformation in there. And so 2%, so most of the workers never even realized it. It was activists who said, you know what? They're taking it away from us, that little 2%. Now, in some of these funds, this is a huge operation. The, the, the group that really took it on and that was the best at it were the Dutch because they're also two, and we think of the Dutch as sort of a rather reasonable country when it comes to economy and all of that, right? And, and now they have cows resting on water. I don't know if people follow what the Dutch are doing, but it's quite amazing. But anyhow, so, so that took also, people were very surprised at the Dutch funds. And so, um, so it turns out that 
you know, this is just capturing. And the Dutch fought back. It was a battle, took two years. Brilliant economists, activist economists. And they recovered that 2% to the retirees. So instead of having three, they had been losing 5%, two for the management. And then they got back to normal. In the United States, it's almost impossible. We have some very good funds with fighting people. They cannot extricate the funds from the financializing that has happened. And financializing really is a, is a completely different mode. It's algorithmic mathematics. I will talk a bit more about it a bit later. And it just, it, it's a capability that is difficult to control with existing law and existing sort of modus operandi. So this is like, I, I don't know if people follow what I'm saying, but this is absolutely almost obscene. You know, that you're taking out just a bit of money. Now, the financial sector had to persuade, you know, the, the people who were managing that this was a good idea, that or everybody would make money. And so, in fact, no, it's a loss. But there is a gain, certainly, for the financial firms. They're very happy. Huh? But this, to me, is, is sort of bordering on the scandalous. Um, now, here a very different bit of the, the story that I'm trying to develop. And here I could have used... Uh, but anyhow, I can. Now, I lo look at the, at the title here. The title is sort of, this is, this is something that comes from the IMF, by the way, staff people, but very good. It's not, you know, w the data that the IMF produces is our data. I always say that. You all have access to it. Some of it is, however, not accessible. But in principle, I always tell my students, go to the IMF data, go to the central bank data. That is people's data. We pay for it. We the people in all our countries. And so I'm always amazed at how little it gets used. Anyhow, here's an example. This comes from IMF staff papers. This is not necessarily made into a book, but it's just continuously. I, I selected a particular period, which is when Eastern Europe um, cha changes, changes model, so to say. So look at the first the title. Ratio of household credit, credit, huh? credit. Credit sounds like such a good thing. It's debt huh? to personal disposable income. But the language itself is significant here, like the dark pools in finance and then this. So, so take a Czech Republic or Hungary. Those are two fairly extreme cases. See, this is shortly after they are out of the the, you know, the old mode. Huh? They enter the Western mode, so to say. So from, go, they go from 2000 to 8.5% household debt. Five years later, 21% and 33%. That is one of the clearest, and so you can go. That is one of the clearest indications of how our modernity at this stage functions as an extractive mode. Not all of it, clearly. But you know, but uh, are you with me or not? Can you follow what I'm saying? Right? Now, the United States, hey, they were already over 104%, you know, when those were just babies. <laughs> and now, and then five years later, 132, and now who knows what it is? You know, on the other hand, Germany, look at the stability, 70. 70 is very reasonable, by the way, for a rich, complex country. 70, 70, 70, 70. How boring, no? But anyhow, <laughs> amazing uh, durability. So, so uh, you know, here, these are all, m what I'm trying to get at here, little extractions. You know, that, that stuff over there for those countries that, that enter the West huh, at, a, at a certain point after the wall falls, so to say, um, that means that they had people who went to their houses and said, yeah, you can sign on, there. you can buy this, you just sign, we lend you the money, etc." and then they have, they have the debt. Now I have to move to the next one here. So I wanted to know who owns that debt, that new debt that develops in Eastern Europe. Well, Oh, this is not, I see, this is, this is not, there, I have to then go back here, but, but um, let me just stick with this image. So it turns out there are three major banks that owned 
that whatever that growth of debt because debt is owned by somebody the you, the people who make the debt and the people who enable those others to have a debt huh? so everybody is and so um, a lot of this and so it is actually I think that is the right slide um, is is this it. All right, so here you get yet another sector. But what we found with, with all of this Eastern European moment was that three types of banks were the owners of that debt. In other words, had, and they were all three Germanic. I'm not saying anything negative about German here, but I'm just wondering, I just found it very interesting as I was looking into the IMF data. And so it was Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. Now, why does this matter? One might make an argument, which cannot always hold, by the way, but it is at least to be considered. If the debt of those modest households is owned by a local, regular, little bank, that creates a positive shadow effect in that small neighborhood or community, etc. It's a bit of a romantic image, you understand. We don't really have that option very much anymore. But you actually had it there, because they were just entering a whole new phase, etc. So, so what you have is a multiplication effect that is a positive. So yes, I take debt, which is always a bit troublesome, but my debt gets redistributed through the little bank, the local bank, to make this a bit better and that a bit, et cetera, et cetera. If it is owned by foreign banks, as it turns out, most of that debt was, as I said, you know, German, Austrian, and Swiss, it just leaves that neighborhood, that country. You know, so, so there is something, both the debt is fine, OK, but how the debt gets instituted, how it functions, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that really does matter. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? So that I'm not against borrowing or debt. It's just that what I find problematic is that all the profits leave the locality. And this is what we live with now. In the United States, it's extreme. And I think in Europe, quite a few countries, it's pretty bad too. That is not a good model. So yes, borrowing part of life, you can advance, blah, blah, but keep it sort of in the, you know, in the neighborhood. Very difficult to do, and it just doesn't really happen very much. Now, one way of wrapping up this, this bit is to say that extractive sectors, can ex like high finance, can extract even from modest households. That in itself. It's an achievement. It takes intelligence to extract from very modest households, which is most of the households in the world. You actually have to invent the instrument to do that. So you have to, I repeat, you have to stand back and say, OK, they need it, etc. If it then recirculates, it can be a positive. But what we are seeing is not that mode. Eh? It it's really has changed. Now, here's yet another extractive mode. <clears throat> this is the big housing disaster that happened that is usually simply represented as a question of housing. It's much more than that. Housing was simply an instrumentality. This was not about housing. It's a mistake to think that this was about housing. And what lies behind the capacity to transform what we see in its full materiality as housing was brilliant, brilliant algorithmic mathematical functions. Because that's what we're living with now. That some of the math is brilliant, beautiful. You know, br the way it gets deployed is the problem. So I'm not against sort of thinking through, innovating, etc. What I'm against is the utility function that attaches to it nowadays. So I want to talk about this case, which now has had ramifications also in Europe. So the United States, uh, the banking system, whatever, you know, a mix of elements, decides that, all right, we are going to, um, we are going to create an instrument that allows people to get a home. Most of the people 
that were involved in this transaction were poorish, modest, because in the United States still, though it's changing now, most people own their house. So we're talking about people who were really poorish, poor or close to poor, very few rich people were involved in that. The representation of this was, here are people who are poor and they think they can get a mortgage and that they will pay the mortgage, etc. Uh, no, battalions of sellers coming from the financial firms, uh, so it's again not the sellers, but it's the ones that invented the instrument. They went to millions, 14 million households. Well, the total was 16 million. Of those 16 million, 1.5 million, actually the, it worked out for them. The rest, 14.5 million, they all went bankrupt. So they were poorer than they started when this was all done. Now, but tracking back, I want a visual. I want to give you a visual. Battalions of people, because remember, they, they got to 16 million households. That's a lot in a very short period of time. And so they went and they said, look, sign. You don't have to pay anything. And it's true. They didn't have to pay anything. Eventually, of course, you know, they, it changes a bit. But, but in principle, they could sign, get the mortgage for zero payment. But what they had to do was sign that. To, do, to get 16 million households to sign, that's more, I'm Dutch, right? That's bigger than, my, than the whole country that is the Netherlands. And these are just the households. When you bring in all the people involved in each household, you know, you really have battalions of humans. And, and so it was a disaster because, of course, everybody went bankrupt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is forgotten, because the crisis hits, etc., but what is forgotten is that the amount of people who were thrown out of their homes, some of them are still living in those homes, but they have to leave. Um, the invisibility of that. If you think of 16 million households, and if you narrow it down to all of those who lost, 14.5 million households, that is how many people? 30 million, as I said, it could be more. Not a visible event. It became visible through the thing of they couldn't pay the mortgage. But their, their bodies, their... No. Now, the U.S. is a huge country, admit it, right? But still, it's a vast number. Now, what was the instrument about? All those houses, little houses, modest, mostly modest houses. We're talking very modest houses. It was not about housing. It was about finding uh, one instrument that allowed, one of many instruments, but this was one of them, one instrument to produce an asset, an asset that you could buy, sell, buy, sell. Because the high investment circuit doesn't want derivatives. Derivatives, as I said at the start, are for us because derivatives are going nowhere right now. They have, and they were in trouble already. So what really was happening here, it was not about housing. It was about a field of material stuff on which you could build an asset, an asset-backed security. Because again, derivatives, which is that they try to sell to everybody, like us, uh, were really not of interest to the high investment circuit. So the real issue here is the brilliance of how they made that transformation. All these little houses de facto become a field of materialities, of assets. It's not about the house. You transform, in other words, and that took algorithmic mathematics. You can do that with algorithmic mathematics. It's extraordinary. So we see the little house, the instrument is not about the little house. The instrument is assets, assets, assets to build asset-backed securities, which is what the high investment circuit wants. And they grab, now, footnote. Each of these things, these negatives that I'm describing, you could think of it as a bit of extraction. Extraction from you and me, from the modest people in our societies. 
take it out, take it out, and build that other thing. Right now, in the United States, the low-income people are poorer. The modest middle classes are poorer. The high end, we're not talking the 1%. The 1% has always existed. That is of zero interest. The old-fashioned 1% is actually adorable. They are like honest billionaires. <laughs> they are not this other mode, you know, where you grab, 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 and die. I mean, the, the, the figures that are coming out on the condition in the United States is probably exhibit number one in the most extreme case. But the impoverishment, the middle class has split into a, a middle class that is richer than they ever thought they would be, and a middle class that is just losing, losing. The working class is also losing, mostly. Um, and, and the old rich, they can't believe the richness of these new operators. You know, now, image. Goldman Sachs, famous firm, you have all heard of it? Um, I want to tell two things, one connected to this and then another element. So go Goldman Sachs, you walk into Goldman Sachs uh, 20 years ago. That's, I mean, this is an image a bit. Huh? Uh, you have 100 secretaries doing all the work. You know? This was very, I mean, old-fashioned banking has nothing to do with what I'm describing. Huh? It's totally different. Now you walk in, and it's 100 physicists. And I'm not blaming the physicists, but this has nothing to do with microeconomics. It has nothing to do with secretarial work. It is a capability. But the algorithm, you know, any of us can build a little simple algorithm. A five-year-olds can do that. The algorithm is an extraordinarily flexible, brilliant, brilliant innovation. Many good things are done with it. So I, I don't want to, my critique is not of the algorithm. My critique is of how a system uses uh, a certain type of intelligence to produce an extractive mode. But right now we know, and the, and the most recent data is coming out, that the concentration of wealth at the top is as extreme as it has ever been. It has never been this extreme in the United States especially. Now, I realize also that I talk, 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 and I don't even know what time it is, but um, uh, let me move on a bit. Now, here, we, what I just wanted to say with this, you already read that, et cetera, et cetera. Here are some of the figures. We're talking millions and millions. Little point that I would like to make here. Um, how is it possible, as I already mentioned, that you have millions of people losing their homes and that you don't see it? You know, for me, one of the issues that comes out of the complexity of our current modes is that the elementary, elementary in, the, in a good sense, you know, the literal sense, uh, is lost a bit. You know, there are superstructures and understructures and I don't know what all, intermediations and all of that. I mean, it's quite interesting what we don't see. We didn't see this. I mean, you, well, you knew about it and you could go to a particular neighborhood, but it is not like oh, a storm is coming, I can see it, no. You didn't see it. People still, many people don't really have this vague this notion. They don't know that this happened. This is a massive event. It would be like voiding my country, the Netherlands. You Dutch, out, all of you, out. That is what it was. And then repeat it. Repeat it. As an invisible event, what does that tell us? about, and I don't have an answer, by the way, but one image that I have is that there is an intermediation that keeps us from really taking seriously a whole bunch of things, including very material things. You know that, uh, but I, again, I, 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 I don't, I'm not making a declaration here of, because to me it is really intriguing that what we see and what we don't see, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let me move on. So this instrument has entered Europe. And um, it goes on and on, uh, on a m much lower level. And again, the, the instrument, what it is about, is extracting materialities and using housing for that extraction. Because what matters is 
the asset-backed security. Huh? So some European countries are doing worse than others, but it's sort of in there. Um, now, one, one outcome of this has been the emptying of urban land in an interesting way. And you, by the way, I'm, I'm sure that some of you know this, but, but in Silicon Valley, you know Silicon Valley, right? On, on famous place. I mean, um, the, the sort of the, the younger generation of brilliant, brilliant minds, they, their salary evidently, at least two years ago, was like 150,000. Uh, that's not enough. They live in their cars. Now they're young, they're, you know, they're, so it's not something that we need to feel, oh, poor thing, it's not. But it just is a datum. They cannot afford housing. So let's imagine the one who earns you know, much less. Um, now, the other thing that is quite interesting that has happened is the buying of buildings. How many of you have been tracking this? This is happening all over Europe, huh? And in, in the United States. No, nobody? Well, you live in a very nice country. No, I think you do, actually, and that is why, you know, why? Everything is fine, you know. Do you have homeless people here at all? That's like not, that doesn't happen here. But in the United States, it happened quite a bit. But anyhow, this, this, is, a, this is something that I, I, did, I put quite a bit of work into this, this kind of project. But this, and this is just one year. This is the buying of buildings in major cities. And you have to, of course, ask the question, what are they buying? You know, and um, the most extreme version, just to sharpen, the most extreme version is all they want is to buy a building. They don't need people in it. People are a nuisance. They complain. You know. So we have very fancy towers in Manhattan that are basically empty. Housing. Housing, luxury. So are the owners of those buildings, are they losing? No. Why? Because again, it's a materiality. So if you see an empty, empty tower, luxury tower, it might, not all of them, it varies yeah, because this is, this is very advanced now, this stuff. I mean, advanced in a sense, a bit rare. Yeah? It's a bit rare. But the housing, it's well, yeah, algorithmic mathematics. It just becomes materialities. There it is, and it occupies a space, so you, you're not easy, to, you know, it's not going to walk away, etc. I mean, you produce asset backed securities that way. This is, but it takes brilliant algorithmic mathematical manipulations and innovations to do that, you know. But so, the, to me, this is quite striking. Anyhow, so one, one of the issues, the, the housing question has multiple things, but what we do know is that for the last five years, six years, uh, a lot of uh, uh, powerful actors, rich whatever firms, have been buying buildings. And what we also know that some of them are empty and it doesn't matter. Uh, so that is, then comes back to what I have already talked about. These are, this is just one year, okay? So every year it, it sort of, so anyhow, New York in that year, there was, these were the acquisitions, pretty significant. I have a list of 100 firms, and it changes, you know, uh, after years. Do you follow what I'm saying or not? Is this clear or not? These are just sort of, you know. Um, and here is the foreign investment. Huh? And uh, for instance, in Amsterdam, there's been quite a bit of buying. And, and, uh, but you can see it. I mean, there is you understand the invisibility that attaches to this. It, there is a nice gracht. Uh, you know, nice Dutch gracht, yeah. But, so, for instance, one Chinese, and I don't have anything against the Chinese, by the way. I have much more against Trump, let's say, than against the Chinese. So I just, but but one, one huge Chinese company uh, bought four beautiful grand grachthuis, you know, on the main, one of the main grachts, etc. London chock full, huh? the, the, the Qatari royals, I love this one, the Qatari royals now own more of central London than the Queen of England. That's adorable, no? 
I find that positively sort of. Uh, now, the, the main owner of central London is not the queen, by the way. It's, it's a lord that has a life of 800 years via, you know, sons and all that. But um, so um, now I wanted to also emphasize a few things. And here, um, it's too complicated and there's no time. But anyhow, that there is this variability, you know, because there, everything is a curve. And in, for me, sort of. And in here, it's very particular because some like Berlin, they bought, they bought the bot. Now, like the last three years, they're done with Berlin. They've done it. They have bought what they wanted to buy. A lot of foreign firms. Eh? And so then uh, uh, Frankfurt comes in the picture. And then whatever. You know, the, there are these, uh, these, I don't have them here. And so, for instance, in China, uh, Nanjing now, just for that one year, Nanjing is being bought up much more than some of the, the more famous cities in China. Why? Because the, the famous, they have been done. And there is a limit. You know, it's not that they want to buy everything. They want to buy particular buildings, which can function as buildings and as asset-backed securities, that kind of a thing. Now, here is, um, so, oh, so Berlin. So Berlin, you see the number there, 11, where? Minus, minus because compared to the prior year, it went down because now they are they are doing Frankfurt and Hamburg is hot. But you know, because they've done the other ones. So it's a literally very selective operation, you know, for just a few, etc. Um, now one thing that comes for me out of this is this 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 notion that when materiality cannot tell it as it is, we have in a way knowingly or unknowingly uh, relied on the, on the material as containing its own truth in a way. You know, it is what it is. No longer today, you know. Most of it, yes, is still that way, but, but not in these cases that I'm describing. And, and here is, this is the Thames, or the Thames, you know, I don't know how, but the Brit says the Thames. This is central London, very, very fancy, etc. Now, I've written about that, but I never go there. But this journalist who read what I had written said, okay, let's go walk <laughs> in those neighborhoods that you have talked about. So we were there. And so I was, I was there, and it's full of tourists there. And I hear these people say, oh, look at these wonderful British buildings. <laughs> and I knew they are all owned by one big Chinese company. So again, the material doesn't tell us, you know, the story. And uh, I mean, these are just a few buildings. They are very nice. I, I never thought this one was so nice. But, but uh, that's just a question of taste. Um, so wrapping it up a bit, the top 100 cities, cities that we're tracking uh, by property investment huh, account for 10% of the world's population. Quite selective in other ways. So actually 10% of the world's population is quite a bit. 30%, uh, this is not my figures, by the way. Huh? This comes from somewhere. Uh, I, I have the, in the next slide, we show the name. 30% of the world's GDP and 76% of property investment. Investment here, I put it in this because investment is not quite the proper term. It's too vague. You know, it's an acquisition. Investment sounds a bit, is, is different from just getting it. Um, now, according to Savills, which is really, like I, I had to, I was doing some research on Phnom Penh and I wanted to know what's happening with buildings there, etc. Hey, you go to Savills, they have the data. Now, they are sellers. Uh, they are, they are uh, but they do have very smart people. And they're all over the world. So just, just mentioning that. Now, according to them, this is the value. Now, that's a lot. That's more than global GDP of all the countries in the world. Which again, comes back to where I started. The measures that we have, you know, they are, they are losing traction. There's too much that falls outside of it. Um, just, just wrapping up here, this, is you can see the you can see the information there, right? So this is 
purchased by overseas companies. It's 60,000 plus buildings. This is in the London, in the greater London area. Uh, none of them was bought by an entity in the country. None of them has a specific name. It's all just you know, a very generic term. Many of them are empty. So, you know, this is stuff that who knows what is next? We don't really know, but it's pretty dramatic and sharp interventions. That's one way of putting it. Now, I have nothing against foreigners owning whatever, you know, but, and, and that's not my point. My point is not the foreignness of it, but it's the secrecy. Now, we know that forever buildings have been used to cleanse your dirty money, right? But we're, we're beyond that here. Yeah, there might be some of that, but there are also other projects. Um, now, here we have these luxury towers in Manhattan that are, by now they're dark. The few people that were living in them said, look, I'm moving out because I'm alone here. I might have been 17 in one of these huge luxury towers. So we have three of these luxury, super luxury towers in Manhattan now. Oh, I dropped one, I guess. But, um, and again, they are basically empty. But, you know, nobody's complaining. Again, I don't know exactly. This is something that I, these three buildings, uh, of which I'm just showing two here, I don't know exactly what's happening. But there seems to be no push to make sure that they get occupied. Renting or just selling to a buyer who then owns it evidently is not so interesting for the actors behind it. You understand, right? I'm trying to... Uh, now, I want to end. I have to end with this image, which I've jumped over quite a few things, so, so you, you may not... Um, understand it. To me, this is the future. What you have in Europe is extraordinary. A lot of small, reasonable cities, etc. But the future is this. And we're beginning to, to see this in, in the big cities, say in the United States, that at the edges, you have a lot of people who are sleeping on the street or creating, you know, these improvised housing, etc. This is a very dramatic picture, by the way. There is no place in the world where you can stand and see this. The photographer who did that took, this is for real, huh? and, but, but that is a set of towers from various cities, and he just juxtaposed it. So some people ask me, you know, when I talk about this, they say, where can I see that? Where do I have to stand to see that? No, you can't, you know, I just want you to know. <laughs> but it is sort of, it captures something. And again, it shows the particularity of Europe because you have a history of small cities, but these cities are real cities. In the United States, we have the big cities and then we have a lot of tiny cities that are barely cities. I remember when my mother came to see me, this goes back now a long time, when I was a student at the University of Notre Dame, which has a city uh, of 300,000 at that time. Now it's more like a million. And um, so we stood there, and my mother said, my mother, very, very Dutch, where is the city? Because it just was not a city. It was just a set of buildings, and yes, shops, of course. But you know, this whole notion, the, the European tradition is truly an interesting event, and that you have cities that have existed for so long and that are, in a way, small because they started so early on. Sure, they grow a bit, but you know, it's, it's very different from what, the, the, what you see in the United States is a mild version of what you see in Latin America. I grew up in Latin America and where you have these endless cities and what you see, of course, in parts of Asia and parts of, of, uh, of Africa, etc. You know, and finally, a lot of people are going to wind up on little ships, on big water bodies, because that's where we're going. Thank you very much. They are negotiating. I don't know what, but no. <laughs> It's
from, from us. Oh, oh from the university. I, I owe you the money. Oh, very. Oh, a, a, a scarf. It, it, it is a gift from the rector of the university, I hope. And it's a university. Yeah, it has the flame as a, the symbol of the university that one of the designers uh, finished designing. Right. It's the okay. Of the expulsion for you. There it is. That's the Prezi. Beautiful. Thank you, Saskia. All right. So we're going to do um, discussion. And I think that Saskia has once again shown, as I think she always does, that she has a most incredible special talent for very alarmingly insightful kinds of conceptualizations, but that are, that are entirely associated with empirical research. And then they illuminate that empirical realm in a new way that you hadn't seen quite that way before. And she's always been doing that, and I think she did it again this evening, so let's give her a round of applause. Okay, it's, it's just true. So now, then, uh, over to you. Uh, th this was predatory formations, extraction. Remember, that's the gist. Nico. Sorry to be, again, the one to start <laughs> comments and questions. I have one, co one comment, one question. Um, the penultimate photo, it, it actually, uh, the landscape, it could have been from Caracas. Maybe you have been there. I lived there Caracas. for many years, and yeah. Caracas is like that. And when we think about the, the buildings owned in London by shell companies, the, the, the rulers of, of, of Venezuela, they have, they have uh, uh, invested hundreds of billions in shell companies, and they could be among the owners of the London buildings, and they don't want anybody to live there because they are, they, they are washing drug money and, and gold money and diamond money and so on. My question is that uh, uh, with the failure of the, uh, of, 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 of the mortgage mortgages uh, in the United States, is it also a failure of using the class action uh, mechanism to um, to make claims on the banks because banks were selling doc, uh, um, uh, securities which the banks themselves were betting against that they should fail, exactly. but they were selling these securities to their clients. So this would be a criminal offense. And why was it not taking, taken up into the courts and as a class action suit? Yeah. That is a very important question and a very important issue. And there is quite a bit of debate now but what we need to understand, we, that was like a 10-year mini history. Huh? Not many, but mini. Huh? A little history of 10 years. It's early on that the extractions, the positives for the, all kinds of investors, huh? and is, it happens. And then they sort of let it run down. And then it is understood as a crisis, these people thought they could own a house, they can't pay their rent, they can't pay their mortgage, whatever, right? And that sort of settled the understanding. Now, at the same time, there were people who launched, because I, I, I also got information from this, who launched uh, freedom of information requests uh, to expose some of this, because I was not the only one who was seeing this stuff. I mean, people knew. And certainly people in the business knew. And some people in the business, that big word, were actually honest people. And in fact, they were also, they, they were at a disadvantage. Many of the bankers, the traditional bankers were at a disadvantage because this is not traditional banking. This is something else, right? So there was quite a bit of hair convolute, sort of, but then it sort of died out. Now, we still live with that condition today. Now there is a new condition where you would think, well, let's rise up and contest, which is the, the housing question again. Huh? But, but um, uh, I'm, I'm doing this work. Has any of you seen the film Push? Push? It's an amazing film. It's the rapporteur for housing of the United Nations, Leila Farhani. She's right now in Nigeria, but she has done seven countries, mostly Europe and the United States, uh, tracking one particular firm 
a major financial firm, major financial firm, one of the richest people in the world, who has bought up a vast number, I mean, we're talking vast numbers of big housing complexes that are for low-income people. And what has he been doing? For this is a story of the last two years. He goes and says, look, you move out, we fix it, you move back in. So move back in often is problematic because they, usually it's more expensive. But the other story is back to the assets. Those properties, they are multifunctional. They're not just, you know, so because the search of assets and asset-backed securities really is what the outcome. This is, this is an astounding uh, moment uh, because, you know, you need materialities. The, the, the brilliant thing is that any materiality can be transformed, because, but, 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 you know, it's a very complex operation. So this, is a, this, is a, this guy is brilliant, this crook is brilliant, and we are tracking him, and he has already sent me his, um, because he doesn't like what I'm talking about. I do a lot of talks, you know, which are more, more specific on this particular thing. So, so, so one way of thinking about this current moment, I don't want to lose the plot from, from your question, is a real search by powerful actors for material, for the material which is sort of interesting because we've moved away from that. When algorithmic math, mathematics emerges in some of the, the innovations around the digital, we thought we had, that was. Eh? And, and now, something has changed again. I, I, I'm giving you a very long answer and I don't know that people are following, so maybe I want to end. But, but um, there is a logic involved in all of this. We cannot fully track everything that is happening but we're tracking quite a bit. And for those of you who are interested, the film, as I repeat, Push, is excellent. Leila Farani, short, little woman, has gone around the world uh, fighting. So she had a major event in Berlin, major in Paris, etc. Because people are really mobilizing in Europe, too. You may not have picked up on this. But I don't know if people are. But there's a lot of mobilizing. And, and Berlin is a hotbed of, of activity. And so are, so are a few other European countries. So anyhow, I'm, the, I'm rambling now. I apologize for that. I'm just sort of rambling. But there is, there is quite a bit to be said about your point. Yeah. Right there. That was a great story. Thank you very much for that. But wasn't it a bit of a story of, a bi of the big bad wolf who was doing this nasty extractive um, set of tactics and strategies, which they do. I'm, I mean, I yeah. fully yeah, 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 I yeah. agree with that. But isn't it the case yeah. that that is made possible precisely by the alliance of local governments, national governments that sit on their knees and make it very much possible that these kind of predatory yeah. practices are, yeah. are possible. Yeah. London is the classic case. It has been acting as a right. prostitute for 20 years to make yeah. that possible. I live in Amsterdam now. It did not used to be like that in Amsterdam, of yeah. course. This is the last 10, 15 yeah. years precisely yeah. because the national government uh, has been liberated to such an extent that it made these kind yeah. of extractive yeah. practices not just possible, it nurtured them, it manufactured them, it produced them. Should we therefore not, together with the story of the big bad wolf and the global financial yeah. network and circuits, also consider the direct uh, uh, yeah. Uh, collusion? Right. All yeah, all there is collusion. Yeah, absolutely. Story. Look, all you're saying is correct, and, and also this collusion. However, the instruments they do, did not come from governments. Governments could, you know, and maybe in some cases they actually had also teams doing that. This came from the financial firms, not the traditional banks either, huh? but it came from those financial firms. And, and uh, again, it's a whole new mode of developing an instrument. But what is to me critical, what I would say is the most important item from, from your comment, is just a bit different from your comment, but you know. But I think governments are simply unable to cont and so and legislators. Now talking about the United States, unable 
to really understand what's happening, partly because they don't do their homework. I always say they don't do their homework. And so they, for instance, regularly, this is by law, the, 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 financial, the big financial firms have to go and uh, explain what they're doing and declare. Well, they speak a language. And so you see the, the senators and, the, and the, you know, the, the parliament, so to say, they're just sitting there yawning. They're not understanding. They don't bother. Why bother? You know, they give me money. Huh? That, so we really have a corrupt situation in that sense that, that goes beyond, you know. Um, I, I, I give you, then there are other elements. I didn't talk about this. So I'm in a field, big, oh, in, the, in North America. I know why I was there, but I didn't fall from the sky there. Huh? But anyhow, this is the story. Truckers, big trucks, huge sheets of metal. I didn't mention this, right, or did I? No. Huge sheets of metal. And so I say, what, what are you, where are you carrying? Where, where, where? And, and uh, we don't know why, but we've got to regularly, we have to move it from here to there. Now, I knew a bit of this. I knew that Goldman Sachs owned those huge, how do you call it, eh? the big buildings where you store huge metal sheets. But I didn't know everything. And so I understood something. This, by the way, went, was a case that went to, to, to law, to legal procedures, and they wound up having to pay $5.2 billion. That is nothing for them. But the question is, what was happening there? Can any of you guess? The truckers are moving these huge sheets of metal, moving, huh? Crises. Not among the builders, by the way. They, you know, they hang out. And, you know, not among the truckers either. Crisis here. This I didn't talk about this, but there is an in-between space where a lot of what I'm talking about actually takes place and becomes this extractive form. You extract a lot of advantage. Once you're back down here, forget it. So here is a point in this circuit up there is where all kinds of investments are done and, and stuff that it's not a, mat a world of material stuff. It's a world of investment and speculation, etc. By d Goldman Sachs, by the way, owned, as I said, these, these big uh, thing storages where they were having the big sheet of huge sheets of metal. I mean, we're talking huge. Um, Goldman Sachs was delaying a delivery. Now, the guys here who are going to do the building, or the owners of him, they don't have a bit of a delay, etc. These guys were saying, I don't know why we're moving this stuff around us. But here, it's a crisis. We are running out of steel, or these metal sheets, which is basic stuff for construction of all kinds, etc. What that did, you guessed, price goes up. So it was dirty pool, as they say, but involving huge trucks, huge metal. Sh I mean, and we have many such. Ca this case became public, and as I said, they went and they never want to go to court. You understand? They they just pay. But there's a lot of that, and so it is this. What 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 people people still think that it is? I am the buyer. And or the seller and a buyer, you know, no, no, and that that is the world. That the, all, a lot of what I'm describing, including about the buildings, happens here. It's a mode of speculating. It's not about owning a material thing. It's something else. It's about speculating about on etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the metal sheets are actually real stuff, right? But but this gives you a good sense. That do you? Am I? Am, are you with me? Of the extremes to which they go to do this, and $5 billion fine for Goldman Sachs, nothing. Because they made, they raised the price, they made a pile of money, and they do this all the time with, with, uh, with all kinds of materialities, you know, plants and, and, and food stuff, etc. So it's, this is the new thing. In our, I mean, it, it has existed for 20 years at least, huh? but this third space, where you can speculate, speculate, speculate. And we have had several cases in the United States along the lines of this particular one that I just described. 
Is that clear or not? Yeah? Okay, good, good. Andreas, but just, just before Andreas, behind you, talks, um, I recently saw a number from a study on foreign direct investment, yeah. the global aggregate. I forget how many trillion it is, but it doesn't matter. 40% of all the so-called foreign direct investment movement of capital in the world is fictitious capital that's just been moved around between shell companies in order for tax evasion. Yeah, that is also very. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Andreas. Yes, Andreas Bieler, currently here at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. Thank you very much for the very inspiring talk. The only thing, what, what I don't fully understand, why you would be so surprised about these kind of developments. Because <laughs> well, if, we, if we look at it through... Perhaps I'm giving the eyes a of, talk, you know. Could just, I mean. yeah, <laughs> if you look at it through the, perhaps the perspective of uh, David Harvey, yeah, and he talks about this crisis of over-accumulation, where we have an enormous amount of private capital. Who, who talks about... Oh, Harvey. David Harvey. Oh, yeah, David, he's a dear friend. Right, right. Desperately... Yeah. looking for profitable investment opportunities. And then, of course, where can you still invest in these kind of properties in these various cities? This but is see, that is a potential. different approach. Huh? And, the, and the pressure, the pressure is systemic, and it's not necessarily the bad financial person, and right. it's not necessarily the corrupt local government, but there's a heavy systemic pressure to find these profitable investment yeah. opportunities. But you see, I, I think we've just, what I'm describing ha is, has exited that point. Because every instrumentality now can be used. Now that might be a minority of investors. Most investors are, are, are not dealing with this, what I'm describing. But this is just the opposite of that. You know, the, 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 the notion of crisis, we can run out of this or run out of that. Forget it. They, they, it's just a, it operates at another level. So, so what I described now, th this was not about a crisis uh, in terms of construction. This was about inventing a crisis in order to raise the price of one material. That's different from that other form, which also exists, which is a more common one, and which is historically what we critics have described. What I'm describing here is yet another mode. And it's pretty rarefied in its own way. But you know, it's also expanding. So, so we have that, what you described, and you know, and, and then we have this. For, for this, it's very difficult to have a crisis. They operate in this in-between zone. You know, it, it's, really, it's really different. And, and of course, it's alarming, you know, it's, it, there is something and, and I mean, the United States is one, one, maybe the exhibit number one, in terms of the extraordinary concentration of wealth that has happened. But we have multiple modalities in play. I just focused on one, so I appreciate your comment because it's very important to understand that that, that more familiar mode of accu capital accumulation is also going on. That doesn't go away. But these guys up here, they, anything can be transformed. And, and what I find so extraordinary is how, because they have to find the buyers too, you know, it's not literally a buyer, but an investor, whatever it might be. And, and it somehow is working. Now, in my reading, I always say this, no formal system of power, and this is a kind of formal system of power in some ways, lasts forever. They will run out of this, you know. But for now, it's, it's very problematic. And that is, I mean, I don't know if people have followed the housing question. Again, I, I, I recommend the, that, that film, Push, uh, which was, I mean, it, we have a housing crisis in the West in the sense that the prices have gone up extraordinarily. I mentioned the people in Silicon Valley, that the young guys, you know, who stay in the car, well, they have something, you know, and they have good income, but house, no housing. I mean, we, something is happening, and the United States is a bit of a brutal country, you know. It, it's, it, mafia, it's its own mafia concept, you know. It, they, they, um, they just cut across all kinds of laws, etc. And our legislators don't do their homework. We have exceptions, Elizabeth Warren, huh? But most of the legislators, they, they don't want to really do that work. So it's, 
You know, again, I want to repeat, the U.S. is extreme. It's an extreme case for various reasons. Oh, Jeremy. <laughs> Professor Gould. Uh, thank you very much. My name's Jeremy Gould. Uh, I'm maybe one of those who wasn't exactly sure whether I understood everything that you said, but uh, I was suitably outraged, nonetheless. You uh, were you were what? Suitably outraged. Outraged. By, by this. Um, yeah. It seems to me that, um, just testing my understanding, is that the materiality of the foundations of the asset-based asset securities is also a, renders them somehow vulnerable because they are, because they are, uh, as right. you say, they cannot walk away. And that uh, a, a government um, that wanted to do something about this could appropriate those properties. And nation, I guess nationalized would be the word that we used, used to use, use for them, thus taking out the, the bottom out of this, uh, out of, out of this system. Um, so my question is, is, is that, is that uh, a correct observation about the vulnerability of, of this particular instrument? And second, what would be, in your opinion, the political conditions for that kind of blowback to take place? And how does that relate to your very interesting observation about the, the blurred boundary between legality and illegality in in the, in the workings of these particular... Sorry, it's a complicated Yeah, question. yeah, yeah. I don't know that I can uh, ad address everything. You know, my reading, huh? my reading, and it's partial, inevitably, etc., uh, is that certain concerns, like your questions, right, that could be, okay, so how do we do this? I have the impression when that the chips are down, you know how that English expression, right, that doesn't matter. They have found a systematicity to use a certain kind of language that, you know, they, they have it. They have it. They cannot fail. I mean, this, this, there can be actors that fail, but right now, they have it made. I think that is my reading. And we are having difficulty unsettling that. I mean, again, as I said, this is not going to last forever. But what is absolutely remarkable now is that just about anything can be made into something that can then be sold as value. And that is why it hits more and more people. And most legislators cannot wrap their brains around this. So I'm one of those where many now, in the, not many, but we are a few in the United States who are saying, we need scientists in there. We need, you know, we need, we need stuff. The, the, the financial firms have done that. They're bringing in all kinds of knowledges. And what you see, I mean, when I look at the data, they are doing that with more and more stuff. You know, we have always had markets for commodities, right? That's an old story. So I always love to say, you know, the United States, uh, 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 New York, the New York uh, uh, banking system there, that Wall Street, whatever, is, is a major uh, negotiator for coffee beans. Well, they don't have a single coffee bean, right? The actual coffee beans are somewhere else. So now that's a long story. Right? That's an old story. I mean, that has long been the case that way, you know? But that also gives you a sense, a possibility, a sense that, right, if the commodity traders could trade and make a major center in New York for coffee beans when it doesn't grow any coffee. I can see that how that then scales up, you know, and then, and then it becomes, it enters another zone, it becomes more extreme. So my take of what's happening right now is more at this level. A realization that, hmm, okay, what else? So the field is still growing, I would say. And it is different from that older, the, the Harvey uh, thing. That is also happening. But that's an old modality. Huh? And that has a kind of, we get it. This stuff, you, you just say, what, 
you know, you don't quite totally understand how it can function. And that is why you have this in-between zone of extraordinarily complex instruments. And that is a little miracle, you know? I mean, that, that is really quite amazing. So it's much more extreme than the commodity bit. You know, we commodified. That was an achievement. That took intelligence to transform a coffee bean into a commodity. This is that in some way, so you are, you're on to something in your one way, but it takes it into such a different level and it just eliminates materiality to a very large extent. The material ceases to function as, as the real thing. It's there, but as, a, as acid or whatever. You know? so, so it is different. I'm really tracking it with curiosity, you know, because I say, what the hell is next? But anyhow, if I, could, I get carried away, so if, I, I have to stop If I can so just much. abuse the chair and ask you something. Is that right? So, so I'd say in the, in the power dynamics of this perpetual dance between the private sector um, financiers who have overwhelming capacity and the state, the regulators, the, the state, the, state, the right. regulators. They, let us say that um, the state is always at an enormous asymmetric disadvantage because they're always behind, yes? And they don't have anything yeah. like the capacity of, as you say, the, the private firms' deep pockets, they have almost unlimited capacity to hire genius. And the state will, if they even have the political will, and so on. So what do you think about that? That is like a perpetual problem of getting at them. They are always innovating. They're always ahead. Yeah. No, this is an issue. And, and also the... the I mean, I, I don't know. I think that maybe the United States legislators are particularly corrupted by the system corrupts them. Huh? Not, not all of them, clearly, but many. And, uh, and they are lazy. You know, I, I don't do... They don't do their homework, many of them. I mean, again, there are some, of course, which are very good. But they should be, they should be working on this kind of stuff, you know? And so many other things. It, this, is, this is just one element. So... so um, uh, I mean, I am one of those people who, who thinks two, two, two things. One is the famous Plaza Agreement. Do we remember that? Early 1970s? Yeah. <laughs> Some of us do. Uh, right. So that was like a little intervention that actually enabled quite a bit. Because we talk about the Plaza Agreement. So the focus is on the Plaza Agreement. Agreement. You know, like something... Hell, you know, it was a first step going, enabling certain kinds of things, you know. So, so, so we, we privatized, we deregulated, we globalized, you know, as I said at the start. And those are the elements that capture the imagination, the media talk about that, that stuff that we can all, we can all understand. But what is more difficult, and here the political classes have trouble, even, I mean, Warren, Elizabeth Warren, you know who I'm talking about? Formidable. But you know, when it comes to high finance, what she has done with high finance is, is household finance, basically. Domestic, you know, low, sort of simple. Uh, I want to see her move into this other, but that's, she has not done that yet. And she is one of the few who actually has very specialized knowledge, but on one particular vector, consumer finance, which is very important. But it's very simple also in many ways. But I think sooner or later she's going to see that the other elements are also in consumer finance. I don't know if people are following me now, but um, maybe I'll stop talking. <laughs> because it gets, it gets very detailed. Yes, Florence. Yeah, I would like to, because this is a... If you have been able to do this work in Latin America or elsewhere, and if it's what yeah. pattern you have found there. It is happening. Well, I was recently at some meeting in Brussels. One always has some meeting in Brussels. <laughs> Brussels is a very special place, actually, when it comes to the meetings. But um, so there were people from two African countries. They asked me not to make that public, where they know for a fact that this is happening. Italians. The Italians thought they had, were not there. Well, Milano 
has that too. So it's like this crawling thing, you know, and there, again, for me, everything is a curve. So eventually they will have done it, so to say. And that system then becomes more normalized, a bit less aggressive, a bit less uh, producing less incredible profits. It will hang in there and then something else will happen, right? But we're still right now in, in this. Um, so, yeah, well, anyhow, yeah. So it is, it is happening in more and more places. It's quite, I mean, those, well, no. You know, with algorithmic mathematics, you can transform everything. You know, it, you it have... just is a, extraordinary. And it's open system, you know? The law, how does the law deal with a system that is foundationally open? that you can move in and change, you know, without, I mean, it will be a long time, I think, before our legal system can wrap its brain. And we now have legal scholars who are experts and we're beginning, you know, to, to work on this. But say Warren, that we all respect, she did consumer finance. Consumer finance is a, is a clear domain. It has long existed. It's one of the simpler domains, but it, is, it matters to people. But they have all that other stuff, you know? So that is a bit... That is a bit the issue. But, but you have done specific work in, in Latin American cities, for example, that have you mapped how has been that investment in Latin America, for example? I, no, I am in contact with people. Africa is especially interesting. I don't know why. Africa is more significant than some of the smaller. I mean, Chile is in play, eh? let's be clear. Argentina is in play. But uh, uh, what is amazing is in some of the African countries that, that we don't think of as, you know? Yeah. But they are very worried. Huh? They don't want it known. So I cannot mention the countries that. OK, last question. Yeah, Ira. <laughs> so is there something that you could say about that? Because I'm working on <laughs> Cambodia and Laos and that <laughs> region. And it was interesting because I think there, I mean, there is an example where a lot of this real estate speculation is very conc concretely linked also to other perhaps less uh, uh, elaborated forms of, of exactly. expulsion, like the whole yeah. land grabbing issue in the, in the more agrarian areas. I mean, it's, it's linked to the, all the real estate speculation and the, the profits made in there in Phnom Penh. So no, that, Phnom that Penh is something is, that can right. take place in many of the southern contexts, yeah. but I, I don't know if. I think that I did quite a bit of work also on Myanmar, the Myanmar situation. Rohingya. So my big take, I got criticized you know, enormously, was let's stop thinking in terms of just human rights violations keeps us from seeing the actual motivations in play, you know? That they, 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 well, the analysis was just about religious persecution. I said, what, what do we see if we just stop this, this answer, religion? So you cannot imagine, and then now, now they have recognized that I was right, huh? but uh, you cannot imagine the, how I was attacked because I said, this, it, I saw it as a, as a real grabbing project, you know, on the part. And we know now that one of the reasons that they wanted to get rid of all the, the Rohingya is because Russia, I mean, not Russia, I'm sorry, the, the, the Chinese uh, are building a huge port in Rakhine State, the poorest <laughs> forgotten state, in order to have direct access, you know, to the Emirates, to all of that. And I kept saying, you know, they, this is, this is not about religion. This is, and the army runs the economy eh, in Myanmar. So you have all of these things. Um, I have gotten myself into quite a few situations where the amazing thing is that I always learn something <laughs> from that. So I said, okay, you know. But, uh, I, I, but the reason I'm talking about this is, is the language we use, what we keep out. So that is why I'm at the beginning when I said, you know, can we cut across our so I appreciate your, your comments.
<laughs> okay, because we're, we're about to run out of time. I wonder why you give explain all this, what happens through... Where pilots. are you? I'm Anne Haila, University of Helsinki. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, sorry. You, you don't hear me? Yes. Okay, so I wonder why you explain everything through financialization, you emphasize that this is not about housing, and however you have uh, these figures of buying of properties, so... Don't you give any role to the property and land and housing? Oh, but I've written a lot about housing and land. I is that what you're saying, why I don't? Oh, yeah, but I look at housing in, in a particular context. No, Did I not understand? Housing, but property and land, because you seem to emphasize this financialization and circulation of financial capital and yeah. algorithm. Uh, well, there is a traditional notion of financial capital. That is not what I'm talking about. No, no, I'm just... Uh, what I'm seeing is a new mode of, to put it very simply and vul vulgarly, a new, a new mode of making money, which is a bit invisible to our eyes. We have to sort of move into it. But it's also a mode of for me, extraction that takes out, grabs, 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 leaving spaces, very abstractly put here now, uh, uh, you know, abandoned, ruined, whatever. You know, there's a lot of destructive stuff that goes on. Lives destroyed, like what, what the case of the mortgages. Um, but it's not that... The financializing is just a critical instrumentality here, you know, but it, partly because it can be deployed onto so many, many very different subjects. And it's different in, its, in that capability than traditional commerce and some very advanced forms of commerce. You know? It's just a very particular way of dealing, and it is expanding. So we've gone from the commodity old, familiar way of, which is also a mode of making something more abstract, right? The commodifying huh? of stuff that goes back a hundred years or more um, to this mode, which is yet another mode. And both exist because we still have, I mean, most, most uh, uh, banking in the world deals in a way with commodities of one sort or another because a commodity is an easy way of trading in something that you don't need to have, like I was saying about New York, big trader in, in, uh, in certain commodities, it doesn't have that, like, like uh, coffee beans. You, you know, this is yet another mode. So these other modes are also there. But this is, this is a bit different. This is, it's also more aggressive. Because commodities, you understand, there's nothing wrong in principle with commodifying uh, coffee beans. It's, it's a mode of selling. It's a mode of making it accessible to all kinds of people. You know, it doesn't have to be a negative. This, what I'm describing, is pretty much a negative because the concentration of wealth is outstanding. So the traditional commodifying, which was a form of grabbing, no doubt, eh, by certain actors, they, but in itself, you know, we really... It, it's okay, one would say. Mostly it's okay. Otherwise, we would have, our life would be much more complicated if we didn't have the commodifying in some ways, huh? in some ways. I don't know if I'm communicating. I'm sorry. I realize that I have a way of speaking sometimes. It's all in my head. We professors do that. I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> but I'm hoping that I'm communicating something. So, yes, the commodifying. And now we have this other thing as well. And this other thing now is becoming an object of study, an object of debate, you know, we are beginning to talk about it. It has existed, however, for a bit. Eh? It didn't fall from the sky sort of two months ago or something. So that is, to me, also very interesting. So why don't we thank, thank Saskia in the usual way? <laughs> <laughs>